trusted news source, ABC6 News at Noon. Breaking news right off the top this afternoon. I think after you say the prayers and use the prevention, let's do something here at the state of Rhode Island. You know, the assault weapon uh, legislation that's in front of the General Assembly right now, I encourage them to pass that. Let's step up and uh, pass that legislation this year. Governor Dan McKee calling on lawmakers to pass gun safety bills this legislative session. This morning, McKee responding to the shooting in Texas, saying we need to take action. He wants to ban high capacity magazines and assault weapons. Authorities say the shooter in Texas was armed with two AR-15 style rifles when he killed 19 children and two teachers inside a school yesterday. The attack unfolding Tuesday morning shortly after 1130. According to law enforcement, the suspect, 18-year-old Salvador Ramos, shot his grandmother in the head, then crashed his car outside the school. That triggered a response from Uvalde school police officer, who was then reportedly shot by the suspect. Authorities say Ramos, who was armed and wearing body armor, then went into the school, into a classroom, barricaded himself inside, and opened fire on teachers, students, and the responding officers. You just hear all kinds of gunshots going off like nonstop, like constantly gunshots. And the world here all scared on the ground, fearing for our lives. Ramos was shot and killed by police. Two officers were injured in that shootout. Both of them expected to survive. Ramos's grandmother is also expected to survive. And there's still no word today on his motive. But we are learning more about these little victims and their heartbroken families as they speak out about their sudden loss. Here's ABC's Rena Roy. We're learning more about the lives cut short in America's second deadliest elementary school shooting, including Eliana Cruz Torres. Her grandfather speaking to ABC News last night, desperate for answers. What's been the hardest part today, Mr. Cruz? Well, not knowing whether my granddaughter is alive or not. Now learning that uncertainty has become a painful reality. And fourth grade special education teacher Eva Mireles, who was with the Uvalde School District for 17 years. Andre Garcia's daughter Gabby was a student of hers. Miss Mireles, that kind of teaching, that hands on, um, doing whatever she could do to help Gabby, I mean, she, that's the kind of thing she did every day. 10-year-old Javier Lopez also among the 19 students killed. According to his cousin, Javier's mom was at an award ceremony a few hours before the shooting with no clue that she'd never see her son again. Javier's grandmother speaking to ABC by phone. So it's so hard to send your kids to school and thinking they're going to make it back home and they're not. Amarie Jo Garza just turned 10 two weeks ago. Her father telling ABC, my little love is now flying high with the angels above. Please don't take a second for granted. Hug your family. Tell them you love them. And cousins Annabelle Rodriguez and Jackie Casares, both 10 years old in the same fourth grade classroom, also among the victims. We're still waiting to learn more about the rest of the victims. Most are believed to be in third and fourth grade. Law enforcement sources telling ABC News a number of them are children of Customs and Border Patrol agents. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. And the effects of the shooting are being felt all across the country, including right here in Rhode Island. So many parents telling ABC6 they were afraid to send their kids to school this morning. ABC6 News reporter Yanni Trigella spoke with parents today. He is now live in the studio with reaction. Yanni. Yeah, Doreen, Tuesday shooting at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, was the 27th school shooting already this year. And it's left parents across the country and here in Rhode Island worrying about their children's safety and pleading for change. An 18-year-old gunman opening fire, shooting and killing 19 children and two adults at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. Parents at the E.T. Wyman Elementary School in Warwick, Rhode Island, in shock after Tuesday's tragedy. I think about what all of these families are going through and to deal with losing their children and to know that this is just keeps happening. The shooting is the deadliest school shooting in the United States since the 2012 Sandy Hook shooting. Its effects have left local parents in fear as they sent their own children off to school Wednesday. To try to balance the idea that these are 
rare occurrences with the reality that they're increasingly not all that rare. Parents calling for change at a state and national level to invoke policies controlling guns and securing schools. Yes, yeah, send money to the school system. Stop the kids, these uh, people from getting into school and just killing these little kids. In the wake of the shooting, police departments across Rhode Island and southeastern Massachusetts boosting up their presence at schools Wednesday as a precaution. But it's something parents believe needs to become permanent. Law enforcement, at least one officer at each school, you know, outside the perimeter of the school. The nation holding the families of the victims in Uvalde in their thoughts today. But Carloni insists we need more. Thoughts and prayers to the families, and sure, thoughts and prayers to the family, absolutely. But we need the policies to change. We need these laws to change. We need accountability. And we'll have more coverage on the shooting in Uvalde, Texas, and local reaction all throughout the day here on ABC6. In the newsroom, Yanni Tregellis, ABC6 News. All right, Yanni, yes, thank you. Be sure to stay with ABC News for the unfolding details in Texas. David Muir will be anchoring World News from Uvalde. And here on ABC6, we're going to hear from the parent of a child killed in the Sandy Hook shooting. Her thoughts on what has happened nearly 10 years after losing her little girl. That's tonight on ABC6 News, first at four. Now to our weather, and we take a look outside today. A pretty pleasant afternoon out there. We've got some sunshine, and it's a tad cooler. Chelsea's in the Weather Center with more. Hi, Chelsea. Hey, Doreen. Yeah, this morning started on the cool side of things. We were down into the 40s in most locations, low 40s in spots like New Bedford. Now in Providence, we've come up to 65 degrees. That wind is starting to shift, and what you're going to notice in the coming days, the temperatures do slowly start to climb in the coming days. The muggy factor starts to go up just a bit, but not today. Today we're still pleasant, and we're still running slightly cooler than average. We're in the mid 60s right now. Most of the area, especially our inland spots in that mid to upper 60s range, those are the spots that are going to top out around 70 today, which is exactly where we should be with the breeze from the south coastal locations a few degrees cooler. We are running a couple of degrees warmer for our inland spots compared to yesterday at this time along the coastline. Very similar, if not a couple degrees cooler because of that change in wind direction. All of us, though, seeing mainly sunny conditions. We'll continue to see sunshine through much of the afternoon. We'll be clear and cool again overnight, and we'll see that blend of sun and clouds continuing through the afternoon and into the uh, day tomorrow. From there, again, you'll notice those temperatures starting to climb. I'll have a full look at your seven-day forecast in just a few minutes. Tori? All right, Chelsea, thank you. And on Smith Hill today, in just a few hours, Governor McKee is set to make recreational cannabis legal in Rhode Island. Lawmakers voting in favor last night, allowing for anyone over the age of 21 to legally possess up to one ounce of pot. Rhode Island is the 19th state to legalize it. Governor McKee plans to sign the bill this afternoon around 3. Once signed into law, Rhode Islanders will be able to possess marijuana without penalty. Legal selling of marijuana, however, will not go into effect until December 1st. The Rhode Island Department of Business Regulations Liquor Licensing Division will hear testimony on Fuego Lounge today. Two people were killed outside the bar in August, leading the Providence Board of Licenses to temporarily close it. The previous summer, the lounge had to be temporarily shut down after another shooting. Due in court today, 21-year-old Pawtucket resident Scott Ellis. He's facing charges of unnecessary cruelty of animals and nine counts of overwork, mistreatment, or failure to feed animals. A search warrant found seven rabbits, one parrot, one lizard, and multiple rats living in his apartment. Ellis was arrested yesterday. He's due in Providence District Court today. Rhode Island drivers are going to have to wait a little bit longer before we see the new wave license plates on the road. The Department of Revenue spokesperson says it'll likely be this fall when they hit the roads because of a delay in production. The new plate design was selected in April after the public was invited to vote on a favorite. The winner has small blue waves and an anchor. Still to come, we're going to get to politics, including a big announcement from Rhode Island's Secretary of Commerce. And nationally, five states holding key primary elections last night. We'll check in on those big races in Georgia and Texas.
Welcome back in political news this afternoon. Secretary of Commerce Stephen Pryor announcing he's running for general treasurer. Pryor is running as a Democrat. He's been the state secretary of commerce for the past seven years and will officially step down within the next two weeks after he files his campaign paperwork. Pryor faces former Central Falls Mayor James Deosa. And primary elections were held in five states last night, with Georgia being a key state of interest as the power of former President Trump's endorsements came into play. Here's ABC's Justin Finch with more on those races and other key elections. An early night for Georgia Governor Brian Kemp, winning easily over his Trump-backed opponent, former Senator David Perdue. Endorsed by former Vice President Mike Pence, Kemp angered Trump in 2020 for refusing to overturn Joe Biden's win in the state. There were a lot of people that said I wouldn't be the, beat the incumbent state senator, but I knew better. Kemp is facing a rematch with Democrat Stacey Abrams in November, who ran unopposed in her primary. In 2018, Kemp beat Abrams by just 55,000 votes. Also in Georgia, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger won his primary race against Congressman Jody Heiss, who had the backing of Donald Trump. Raffensperger gained notoriety after refusing to find votes for Trump and rejected Trump's false claims that Georgia's presidential election was stolen from him. But in the win column, Herschel Walker, the former NFL running back who was strongly supported by Trump, easily won his Republican primary race and will challenge Senator Raphael Warnock in the fall. Georgia, are you, are you ready? Yes. Are you ready to take that seat back? Walker versus Warnock will be an historic race between two black men, which could tip the balance of power in the Senate. And in Texas, George P. Bush, son of former Florida Governor Jeb Bush, losing the Republican primary for attorney general to the scandal-plagued and Trump-backed current AG Ken Paxton. Also in Texas, a race too close to call between the last anti-abortion House Democrat Henry Cuellar and his progressive challenger Jessica Cisneros. But Cuellar is claiming victory. Justin Finch, ABC News, Washington. Well, coming up, the peanut butter recall expands. More products added to that list. And now, your ABC6 Storm Tracker weather with meteorologist Chelsea Priest.
Well, it's nice and sunny outside today. Perfect sunshine really from start to finish. We had a beautiful sunrise this morning and we're continuing to see a nice bright sky outside as we head into the afternoon. The temperatures are starting to climb. We started the day on the cool side of things. We were in the 40s early this morning, low 40s in spots like New Bedford and Taunton. At this point, some of our inland spots, Norwood and Taunton into the upper 60s, mid 60s in New Bedford, mid 60s here in Providence, a little bit cooler along the coastline. The wind is starting to shift, starting to come in from the south today and that's going to keep us a little bit cooler at the immediate coastline with those water temps still really only in the 50s to maybe 60 degrees in a few spots deeper into the bay. What you're looking at is a change for our inland spots compared to yesterday. Remember yesterday we had some clouds through the morning. It wasn't until later that we started to brighten up. So those inland spots coming up a bit. Along the coastline, though, things are a little bit cooler. So it really does depend where you are, what you're seeing. This time of year, as soon as you get that breeze coming in off the water, keeps us a bit cooler. Now the average high is 71 degrees. We were obviously way above that over the weekend. On Monday, we were still doing okay. Then yesterday, we were on the cool side of things. Today, slightly cooler than that average high. With the breeze coming in from the south to the southwest in the coming days, though, temperatures are going to slowly start to climb. So when we look at the trend, today and tomorrow, hovering in the upper 60s to about 70 degrees, fairly seasonable. Now, Friday and Saturday, as we head into Memorial Day weekend, we're looking at those temps in that low to mid-70s range. So seasonable, if not slightly warmer than average. And the trend continues to go up as we head into the second half of Memorial Day weekend. So so Friday and Saturday, more clouds, some showers around. I'm hopeful that as we head into Sunday and especially into Monday for Memorial Day, we should end up with some brighter conditions, drier conditions. And then you see low 80s by Tuesday of next week, of course, the day after Memorial Day. Satellite radar image shows you dry conditions, sunshine outside. We're going to stay mostly sunny for the remainder of the afternoon. We'll be clear and cool overnight. Much wider view does show you some rain activity off to our west. It's just going to be slow going before it gets here because we're sunny today, dry today, dry tonight, dry for most of tomorrow. It's really not until the, through the day on Friday that we may start to see some scattered showers developing. So what you're looking at is sunshine outside today. Tonight, mainly clear. I think by tomorrow morning you may get some clouds coming in, but another cool night temps down to the the 40s by tomorrow morning. Tomorrow, a few more clouds rolling in, kind of that blend of sun and clouds type day, and clouds will continue to increase more so overnight Thursday into Friday. Some sprinkles out there, some fog. During the daytime on Friday, you may have some sprinkle activity, but it's not until Friday evening that you see this line of rain off to our west that we get some steadier showers moving in, especially late Friday, overnight, and through the day on Saturday. It gets breezy out of the southwest, and that also pumps in some of that humidity. We'll feel a bit more muggy through the later part of the week and more so into the weekend. About 70 degrees today, mainly sunny, pleasant, quiet day. Tonight will be mainly clear, cool and dry, temps down into the 40s. And then tomorrow we're looking at partly sunny conditions. Temperatures in that upper 60s range, a dry, pleasant day. Breeze from the south keeps us cooler at the coast, but again, an overall nice May day. Friday, more clouds, a few showers around, especially overnight and into Saturday. Saturday, scattered showers around, and then we should start to dry out, get a bit brighter and a bit warmer through the second half of Memorial Day weekend. Doing. All right, Chelsea, thank you. Well, today is iced coffee day at Dunkin' Donuts. One dollar from every iced coffee sold in Rhode Island and Bristol County, Mass, goes to Hasbro Children's Hospital. Last year, the iced coffee day raised more than $140,000 for Hasbro. This all started in 2010. Over $2 million raised in total so far. So to come, we have an update on the baby formula shortage and when we'll see it back on store shelves. And Walmart facing backlash for an ice cream to commemorate Juneteenth. Why people are saying it's so offensive.
Back now with some consumer news, and we now have a better idea of when more baby formula will show up in stores. Abbott says it'll reopen the plant at the heart of a nationwide recall June 4th. Supplies should start hitting store shelves about two weeks later. In the meantime, other steps are being taken. The second round of Operation Fly Formula, formula coming in from overseas, arrives today. And more items are being recalled in connection to that GIF peanut butter recall. Initially, there were more than 45 types of peanut butter products recalled due to potential salmonella contamination. Well, now there are more. The FDA says Mary's Harvest, Country Free, Tar and Garden Cut are voluntarily recalling products as well. This includes fruit snack trays and celery snack cups that contain GIF peanut butter. And Walmart is apologizing for selling ice cream for Juneteenth. It was the store's attempt to commemorate the end of slavery in the U.S., but it did not go over so well. The packaging was decor decorated in pan-African colors, which are not associated with the day. And there was a message on the side that read, Share and celebrate African-American culture, emancipation, and enduring hope. Walmart has removed the ice cream from its stores. And Ford is now agreeing to pay more than $19 million to settle claims it misled customers about fuel economy and how much some of its vehicles can haul. Attorneys General from 40 states said the misleading ad centered on some of Ford's hybrid vehicles and Super Duty pickups. Well, coming up, we're going to preview the Celtics Heat Game 5 as the Eastern Conference Finals head to Miami tonight. And we're going to check back in with Chelsea, too, for more of that afternoon forecast right after this. Well, now to the Celtics in the playoffs. The Seas head back on the road tonight. Game five of the Eastern Conference Finals. Boston with a convincing game four win over the Heat Monday, 102 to 82. Yesterday, Jason Tatum named the All NBA First Team. It's the second time the Seas star has earned All NBA honors. The first time he's been on the first team. Tonight's tip is at 8:30. And let's hope we can uh, come out the way we did on Monday yes. as well. That would mm. be nice, wouldn't it? It really would. Okay. Give us some comfort. Yes. Okay, Celtics players. Yes. We Fingers need crossed. this today. Fingers crossed. That mm -hmm. would be very nice. Uh, we are looking at a pretty nice May day. Temperatures hovering around 70 degrees, mainly sunny out there. Tomorrow you'll see a few more clouds. We'll start cool. Temperatures should top out in the mid to upper 60s. And then from there we warm up a bit into the long weekend. Mid 70s for Friday and Saturday. More clouds around, some scattered showers around. I'm hopeful that we dry out a bit for Sunday and especially into Monday with temperatures coming up around 80 degrees. It'll get a bit more muggy too, not 
oppressive or very, very humid, but you'll notice a change. It's so comfortable and nice outside today. It really uh, you'll, is. you'll notice a little <laughs> bit more of that muggy factor going up in the coming days. All right, but as we head out to those parades, we yes. can certainly cope with that, right, Chelsea? Yeah. And thank you everybody so much for joining us for ABC 6 News at noon. The news continues first at four. Have a great afternoon, everyone.